What's up, everybody? This is LibUX, a podcast about design and user experience for libraries in the higher ed web. This week, Mark Dodgson from Canada, from uh, Blue Spark, um, right after this. <laughs> Okay, so I think we first got in touch um, maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, when uh, Indiana University Libraries launched their um, new website. And I wrote a post on LibUX uh, just kind of pointing out this kind of interesting, I don't know, design choice. It got retweeted, and then you and um, BlueSpark kind of introduced yourselves, um, and it turned out that your team was partly responsible. Yeah, so we've been really fortunate to work with Indiana University over the years, and um, and really, I mean, when we're talking about that site, it was really nice to see that post, because it was great, because um, it kind of called out that design pattern, and, and you're seeing it in a few more places, right? You've got it uh, now on the IUL site, it's on uh, the New York um, uh, University Library site. Um, it's a great kind of use for that design pattern, because it really does, um, in terms of search, right, you're going to that home page, the search is the first thing you see, um, but we wanted to give users the ability to um, open or close that, right, so we can bring things above the fold or below the fold, uh, depending on kind of um, the instance of the site that they're on, right, so if they're on an inside page, we're not showing that um, search box by default, uh, we actually have it closed and give them the, the normal search um, icon in uh, in the main menu that they can choose to open or close it, um, but we wanted to keep that open on the, on the home page just to kind of call out that it is there, and, um, and it gives us a little bit more room to um, call out additional features with search, especially when you're working with universities and libraries, right? There's tons of data, lots of content, um, and depending on um, the context of what you're searching, uh, we wanted to be able to control what the user was seeing. To me, it kind of solves a problem where with libraries having so many services and so many disparate services that are both hard to communicate and laden with jargon that, in a way descending just like this big ass search box keeps kind of like the the user's task in mind right um they can just search the site if they're looking for something on the site or they can look for a catalog or whatever rather than having to hunt and peck through various menu items absolutely yeah and i think you know that's kind of the hard part especially when it comes to user experience right is where is is that restraint part of it right is what to hold back and what to show um, and I think, you know, with uh, the IUL site, one of the, the key things is, is the navigation of the, on their site, of course. And we still, we're still using mega menus, um, you know, in a couple spots. But what we've done is we've restrained the navigation to six items, right? So there's kind of this um, thought that anything more than seven uh, main navigation items, a user gets confused. Um, and so, you know, some of the thought around that was reducing it, keeping it at six, um, displaying search in a different manner that is kind of context aware. Um, and that, that really does, I think that all comes down to restraint and, and uh, giving the user the power when they need it. Can you sort of elaborate on how it's context aware? I'm not sure I clicked around enough to... Yeah, no problem. That. So when you're on the, the homepage, we have the, the drop down. So um, beside the search, so you can search articles, books, research help. Um, you can also search uh, journals and library collections. But anytime you um, click one of those icons and start to do a search, It'll actually, you can, uh, let me bring up journals specifically. So if you do journals, we're actually giving you access directly to um, the citation linker. So you, if you don't want to go directly through here, you can go to the citation linker. If you go to um, the library collections and books, you'll see below the search, we're giving you options to go away from the site without doing that search, um, hopefully simplifying the process of finding what you're really looking for. What kind of success metrics do you, are you looking for? Well, this is, I mean, it'll for initial stuff, it'll be down to analytics. And once we get our initial, um, we have a couple phases that we're doing. So the next phase is going to be a little bit more animations. Right now it's kind of um, pops open, things like that. So we're going to yeah, add it yeah. to right? That's one of the things that, I think that's the other thing too, is we, you're trying to get that MVP built, right? So um, this one was a complete design rebuild. So we're doing what we can do in that minimal viable product. Um, get it built, and then do our secondary phases and third phases after that. So there's things to come, um, and in that, we'll definitely be doing testing, right? And we haven't done any of that at the moment. Right now, it's just been getting those phases built. I'm impressed that you were, uh, your team were able to convince a 
<laughs> um, a higher ed uh, organization to go for like the MVP. I think the I think the assumption is that basically you know like they're going to want to see a final product and then change the final product before ever launching it. You know, and then by the time it goes live, it's already wrong and bloated. Yeah, and I you know what I think that comes down to um, company culture and working with different or, like different agencies. So we one thing to state is we have a relationship with IUL that we you know we've worked with them in the past. But I think um, even with working with other um, libraries and other universities is the trick with them is being upfront, right? To say you know here's what we're trying to build. Um, or sorry, they're you know in the discovery phase we're trying to figure out what they want to build. Um, we're trying to figure out what their budget is, um, and I think this thought in, with these types of organization, organizations in the past is that, you know, we want to, we have this budget and we want to build a website that's going to last five to seven years. And in reality, that's not how the web works anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things are more iterative. Uh, user behavior changes over time. I mean, think of how you use the, uh, the web five years ago, right? It's very different than you would um, use it now. And that changes, you know, and, and when you're thinking about libraries, libraries are trying to serve... Um, so many different types of users, right? You've got staff, you've got administration, you've got um, young to old patrons, different age groups, right? You've got um, potentially employed and unemployed. You've got uh, cultural differences, language differences. You've got users with disabilities. You guys have to um, really facilitate uh, an experience that works for everybody. Um, so there's where the challenges come in. And, and I think being up front, working with these organizations, and um, trying to be transparent about what you're doing, right? I mean, the, the reality is you're probably not going to be able to have the budget to do everything all at once, but what we can do is potentially help you um, build an MVP and plan for future phases that are, is, that are going to improve your site over time. Let's roll back a little bit. We don't have to talk about IUL specifically or any of the other libraries, but there's this entity, BlueSpark. Can you say a little something about it? Yeah, I mean, BlueSpark is, um, you know, we're a, a, a fully remote UX design and development shop, and uh, and we design and build large-scale digital projects using uh, primarily open-source technologies. Um, and we've been really lucky to work with a number of uh, amazing universities and libraries. I mean, we do work for Stanford, UCLA, um, IUL. Um, we've done lots of stuff in Canada, too, with McGill. Um, so we've, we've kind of had experience in that kind of space. Um, and so, really, everything that we're doing is is working. And most of the projects that are working are really data heavy, um, uh, data heavy websites. I'm kind of interested, just sort of like how you all fell into sort of this uh, higher ed library niche. That's a good question. And to be honest with you, it's actually before my time, so I wouldn't even have an answer to that. <laughs> it just sort of happens, you know. It just sucks you in. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, one of the, the, the reasons it probably happened um, is that uh, we're a Drupal shop primarily. Um, and Drupal is powering a lot of uh, universities and libraries. I'm curious, like, how Drupal, or why you think maybe, like, Drupal got such sort of a, a hold on uh, higher ed, because you're right, it is ubiquitous, it's, and it's not just ubiquitous in higher ed, it's um, true for a lot of, like, non-profits. I think cost is one of it, uh, one of the, the big things, right? Um, being open source so that it's always being uh, patched, there's a huge community contributing to it. Um, you know, and I think that the other part of that is that it's flexible, right? I mean, Drupal can um, do pretty much whatever you want. I mean, it's it uh, requires custom coding, of course, but it um, it's flexible enough to kind of um, power anything you want it uh, want it to do. I mean, you think about uh, you know the Olympics that just passed. I mean, that was all powered by Drupal, right? So. Um, it can kind of do whatever you want it to do. It's just um, you need to <laughs> put a plan together, and uh, and Drupal can handle that that plan. I think it's interesting that like um, or organizations approach you as the experts, and so feasibly you could tell them like, hey, it's like you really should just spend your money on um, <laughs> this, this higher ed CMS Cascade server <laughs> or something or whatever. Yeah. I mean, they'll they'll pretty much like I'm sure consider your advice very highly and i just think that's an interesting position to be in especially outside of the system itself yeah and i think a yeah. lot of a lot of people that come to us i mean they're coming to us because they know we specialize in drupal um so you know getting them from that next version up or fix you know doing feature requests uh you know it's kind of the the next step for them because 
the reality is if you've got a, a larger organization and they're all used to working in Drupal, whether you know editing, adding content to the site, um, making a switch to a new CMS or a new um, engine for your website is much more difficult than uh, just adding new features or updating your current setup. An organization has appealed to BlueSpark and they're like, hey, we need you to come in and we need you to do like something. What does, if you can speculate the position that the maybe the libraries are in to appeal to an external agency, because especially if they're higher ed, uh, arguably they, you know, scare quotes have access to campus IT developers or they may have some sort of like in-house web team potentially. Yeah, and I think, I mean, with libraries in particular and, and universities for that matter, um, I mean, you have so many internal stakeholders, right? You've got uh, different departments, you've got stakeholders in each of those departments. Um, and sometimes working internally, if you know, if you're working internally and trying to get a project off the ground, it's almost like working with an external agency anyways, right? You're trying to uncover what the, the project goal is, get everybody aligned to that goal, um, and, and try to get the process of what that minimum viable product is that you're going to build, right? So really the first thing we do when we come in is is um, discovery sessions. And, and uh, a couple of things that we can do in those types of situations is getting, um, you know, for the first meeting it might be getting um, all of the directors, right? So the real bosses of what's going on in a room to find out what the real um, object of the, uh, of this you know, project is, right? Because hearing it from them is different than hearing it from the people that actually have to um, you know, manage the project sometimes. Um, so getting, getting some discovery from them and finding out what they're, what they're trying to uh, accomplish and what their goals are and what the, where they see the project in five years from now um, and where they want to be, right? Because no, understanding where they want to be gives us the ability to uh, make recommendations for future phases. Um, and then we could do, and then after that, is discovery with, you know, who's actually the team, the project team for, um, for the, the particular project. And that's where we can go through, you know, the traditional user experience exercises, right? We can kind of go through, um, you know, what are, what are the real project goals? Uh, where are users, you know, how journey mapping, right? To figure out how users are um, using their site, where they're coming from, how they're interacting with uh, the library. Um, both online and and in the physical spaces, right? So, um, so that's kind of part of it. Um, and then once we get you know all those discovery phases done, it really gets into um, you know how we start presenting it. And we have um, a very very defined process, um, which I think helps the situation because it, it helps things um, not only for us to kind of go through the stages, but it also helps. Um, you know, with our clients, the understanding of what we're trying to do, because we explain it um, to them multiple times. Once when we're getting a project, they understand what the um, our process is. But then even in the discovery phase, we're explaining very explicitly, right, like what, what the stages are that we're going through. And I think a couple things that we make sure up front before I go th kind of through the process is um, we need to make sure that on their end that they also understand that there are requirements that we need from them, right? And, and uh, oftentimes that is um, somebody to be on calls with us, you know, once or twice a week, depending on the project, right? So they, they need full-time staff to kind of help us out and, and get the project going because it just won't be successful if we don't kind of get to that next, um, you know, keep them involved and get to the step. Um, we're super transparent um, about everything. If, uh, if, you know, somebody on the team wants to, uh, somebody, you know, at our client's offices wants to see, you know, what we're building, um, they can check out the ticket. They want to see how much time we've invested in a certain part of the project. They can see the ticket. They have access to everything, um, which I think kind of helps build that trust factor. Yeah. Um, which is great. And then, and then in terms of process, once we have all the discovery stuff sorted out, we get into, um, reviewing data, right? So things like analytics, maybe previous tests that um, they've done internally, um, and then we start doing uh, rough sketches, and and that to me is kind of um, you know that's where I, I enjoy the most is when we get into the rough sketch phases, um, and we really do we draw everything out, um, and uh, and then potentially depending on how small the feature is uh, or or the project, we'll do wires at that point, but usually sketches. Um, and then we do processing on, in terms of how we um, estimate everything out. So we have a two-tier process. So we have a um, – because the, the trick with this stuff is that uh, 
organizations have a budget, of course, right? And we want to fit everything in that budget if we can. And the reality is that sometimes it can't, right? So we want to make mm -hmm. sure that we can um, prioritize certain features. And this is where, you know, the relationship um, where being transparent and being um, uh, very communica uh, communicative with with uh, our client helps, right? Because we're being very upfront, even with the hard conversations around budget and money, right? So we have a we have a two tier process, which kind of helps with um, prioritize, uh, prioritize, uh, prioritizing the different features, right? So we have a tier one process, which after we have the rough sketches, we present them to the client, and it is literally rough drawings of every step of the phase um, or the project, and they're rough. Um, and we use we have tools to kind of help facilitate that. Um, we we use Envision um, yeah. and we we link them up so that it's acting as if it's a real site, um, and that kind of helps uncover areas that we may have missed or things that, that our client may have missed. Um, but from that, once we get buy-in on that on those rough sketches, we do this tier one process. And what we're trying to do is um, write tickets based off those rough ske sketches in we use Jira for our tickets. Um, to um, uncover everything that we're trying to build from, from those rough sketches. It's very rough. We're trying to be plus or minus 40%, so it's not accurate. But what it does do is it helps us and our clients prioritize features. So if they see building uh, a certain type of search is going to take 10% of the budget, it gives them the ability to prioritize that and help us focus on where we can cut corners on that one feature. And then once we have the approval on that Tier 1 process, we go back, we modify, we do our wireframes and get a little bit more uh, more detail on um, on those wires. Um, and we do the exact same thing. We go right back into Envision, but these are now uh, we work in Sketch uh, mm -hmm. when we're doing when we're doing the wires, and um, and it gives us that uh, much more detail. So now we're starting to look much more like a, um, a website. Um, and based on that, then we do a tier two planning where we're trying to get within plus or minus ten percent of their budget. Um, and uh, and that really kind of helps us figure out where we're going to be at the end of the project, helps us figure out what the future phases are, and helps our clients um, prioritize um, each of the features within their site. And then once all that's done, then we go into uh, design uh, comps, right? So we'll do comps, and then we get into interaction requirements, so how to build each of the requirements on the front end, and then development begins. Um, but we really do stick to that process, and our clients understand the process, and they're involved in the process, so they have skin in the game. And I think that really helps to um, build a strong relationship, not only for this project, but for uh, future projects, right? Now now we've got um, future phases planned. Uh, they're comfortable with our team. They know that we can interact with their um, their current internal developers. And that's you know one of the things we're asking about is, you know, if they have um, an internal team. I mean, we work closely with those internal teams, and that's sometimes how we have to, um, how we have to bring that, how we're able to bring that budget down or bring the cost down for some of those features. Well, because we're all um, working from the same system, tickets are built, and the ticket, on, on a ticket, it'll tell you exactly how to build a certain feature. We can hand that right off to one of their internal develop developers, and they can build out that ticket, saving the cost there. So. Wow. Yeah, so it really kind of helps get everybody on the same page, keeps the project going forward, and uh, and and again, everybody's kind of involved, which makes the the project a little bit more successful, Dan, because everybody feels like they've been a part of it. Have you seen any patterns emerge where um, where maybe one organization thinks a particular feature is going to be going into the process is going to be super important, but then when they actually find that they have to prioritize it consistently drops down? Or have you seen anything that's like consistent between many um, clients? Yeah, not specific, like uh, a specific feature, but I mean, that happens all the time. I mean, every project we're, um, we're working with clients to prioritize. Um, and I mean, we have this project blueprint. Um, it's like a booklet that we hand out to, to new clients and, and, and potentially future clients. And it has some of these exercises that they go through. And one of those exercises, and again, these are very 
um, basic exercises, but it's just to get our customers um, thinking about the user instead of kind of the overall project. And one of those is feature prioritization, right? So it gets them to list all their major features that they think are important to them right now, right? And it, 16 of them, we'll say. And then it literally goes through almost like, um, you know, the, the U.S. Um, basketball brackets, right, where you <laughs> start putting them against each other. And at the end, you end up with one feature that you find is that's the priority right now. And you've, then you've got your top four, you've got your top eight. You can kind of see them visually, which is um, really useful for, um, you know, people who are kind of involved in the project that aren't visual um, people, right, because they can see kind of where everything um, lies. Um, and, and in terms of our process, there, there's a really great um, video that uh, one of our project managers um, did a talk at uh, DrupalCon, and, and I, you can actually link it up on your site when you when you post this, but she did a, a whole talk about how we came to our estimation process. She is like an unbelievable project manager, and she um, worked very hard with the team to build out this process called How Changing Our Estimation Process Took Our Project Endgame from WTF to FTW. <laughs> And it's a great, it's a great um, listen if you're thinking about why to change your process and come up with a solid one that works for the client. There's a saying, right, that uh, persever- perseverance is not a long race. It's many short races, one after the other. And I think, you know, as UX practitioners, um, we're earning a seat at the table now, right? We just need to keep persevering and pushing forward f- um, for that change for our users, right? So uh, iterative change is important to think in terms of phases, um, and, and try to build that minimum viable, viable product is kind of the, the key to how all of this stuff works because websites now are you know, living, breathing entities that change over time as, as much as our users change. Cool, man. Thank you so much. How can people get a hold of you? Yeah, you can uh, find me on Twitter, at Mark Dodgson. Um, and uh, if, you, if there's anybody that wants to reach out in terms of uh, anything that we've talked about here, you can reach me at my email address, which is mark at bluespark.com. And, uh, and I think you're going to put a post, uh, a link up to um, our project blueprint. So if there's anybody who wanted a copy of our project blueprint, which is, you know, just some initial uh, user experience um, exercises, uh, we'll have that available. Um, and we can either mail you out a copy or we can send you a PDF, kind of whatever works for you. Very cool. Yeah, we appreciate that. All that, like, all of that goes a long way, even just as, at a glance. Perfect. Um, Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. That has been... Another episode of LibUX. We'll see you again next week.